First off, let me say how grateful I am to be here, how grateful I am to be alive, vital and full of energy. I'm also abundantly grateful for the opportunity to share my passion with you in a way that I hope will enrich your personal and work life. My name is Dr. Russ Lomjiu, and I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Now, I've had an amazing career spanning over 25 years. And in that time, I've worked in hospitals, long-term care, schools, home care. I owned a couple of practices and even a rehab staffing company. I've practiced my art with the help of horses, dolphins, clam rakes, scallop dredges, and sailboats. And I've had the great pleasure of never being bored a day in my career. But about 10 years ago, I experienced a life-changing event that caused me to re-examine and reinvent my entire life and career. Now I focus on helping other people re-examine and reinvent themselves. And let me tell you, it's both rewarding and challenging. That life-changing event occurred directly from my multiple and repeated attempts to end my own life. What I'm about to reveal to you came directly from my enlightenment that occurred when I woke up and rescued myself from myself. I'm not going to show you a short video of me in one of my darkest moments. I want you to be prepared because it is not pretty. So he goes, well, you know, we had the wheel. I said, fine, so I get on the scale, and it's one of those electronic scales, talking scales, you've heard of them once, wouldn't you? Get on the scale, and it says, good morning, Lord. God, shut up, Jesus, oh my God. And then this white smoke started to come out, right? This little old low oil light comes on. So you know what he says to me? He goes, oh, well, you have exceeded the capacity of the scale. You would need to go to the post office to get weighed. To the post office. So I go. They didn't tell me how much I weighed, but they told me if I ever tried to mail myself anywhere, they were all going on strike. 300,000 people in the U.S. alone die too soon from obesity-related conditions. Was I in the process of ending my life in that video? You bet I was, and I never even realized it. It's not what you were expecting because you think of suicide differently. We don't think about a painfully slow decline as suicide, but it is. Now, to put this into perspective, 300,000 people a year. Now, the casualty count in World War II for the entire six years was 407,000 casualties. Now, if we do the math, that's about 68,000 a year for each year of the war. 300,000 deaths per year is 78% higher than the U.S. casualty rate in World War II. Now, we project that over a similar six-year period, and that's 1.8 million deaths. Now, we talk about waging war on obesity, but the war is on, folks, and we're already losing 300,000 people a year. And what's worse is that we're on track to create the first generations of humans in history that have a lower life expectancy than our parents. And the sad thing is, these people don't have to die. These deaths occur because these people are unable to change their behavior. Now, there's a lot of people out there fighting this war on many fronts. There are people out there attacking the food industry and government and schools that have soda machines. Now, I get that. I don't even disagree. The issue of a toxic food environment definitely needs to be addressed, but the core of the problem is inside people's heads. Here's, here's the thing. This guy, he's like a lot of us. The person he thinks he is is different from the person he really is. He doesn't see himself as part of the problem. He doesn't see himself as even having a problem. This war, by the way, is not about obesity. It's about behavior. It's about saving people from themselves. You know, heart disease is the number one killer in the U.S. It kills more people than the top three cancers combined. And just about every one of those deaths could have been prevented if people did just five things. 
It's been estimated that those same five behaviors are responsible for 80% of the $3 trillion a year we spend on health care. It comes down to five behaviors, and I bet you already know what they are. Number one, exercise. Number two, eat less crap. And what I mean by crap is calorie-rich drinks, refined sugars, animal products, and processed foods. Now, everybody has a slightly different idea what eating right is, but we all know enough to get started. Number three, stop smoking. Number four, limit alcohol. And number five, manage stress. We all know this stuff. Our patients know this stuff, yet they don't do it. I see it all the time. In my 10 years experience working with weight loss, I have seen that almost everyone knows enough to do to be, get a pretty darn good start. They know what to do, but they can't seem to do it. They don't have a knowledge problem. They have an implementation problem. All said and done, it's not what you know. It's what you do that counts. If you're interested in saving lives, focus on helping people change the behavior that's keeping them from reaching their fullest potential. Because there's much more to life than just surviving, and saving a life could, should extend beyond to helping someone live into their best version of themselves. Getting a patient to actually do their home exercise program could start them on a path to climbing mountains. And getting an old veteran to use a cane might prevent that fall that keeps him from dancing at his granddaughter's wedding. Empowering people to change behavior is at the heart of medicine. Actually, it's way more than that. Empowering people to re-examine and reinvent themselves through changing their behavior allows them to be better spouses, better parents, become financially free, and the list goes on and on and on. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. We get to help people be excellent, and in doing so, we are essentially saving their life on every level. So how many of you would agree that empowering people to change their behavior is important and life-saving? So then why do we suck at it? It's not because we don't care. I know you care. The problem is that we are not taught the skills. It's not taught in PT school. It's not taught in medical school. We rely on our common sense to motivate, and it just doesn't work. We rely on the same three failing strategies, and we'll go back to them over and over again, even when they fail. I call them the three F's of making people change. And number one is the facts. We believe that simply loading people up with facts, they will magically change their behavior. Information is important, don't get me wrong, but tossing information at people and expecting them to act is a flawed approach. Information is like electricity. The electricity charges the battery, but unless the wires are connected, the light never lights. Facts actually work, but only when the person has the right mindset. And, and what I mean by that is that a, a, they have a well-constructed belief system. As we'll learn later today, beliefs create a literal structure within someone's brain. When the information that you're trying to install is incompatible with that belief architecture, it's rejected. I mean, have you ever tried explaining lung cancer to a smoker? It is, if it, it is as if the wrong key has been put into the lock. If the key doesn't align with the architecture of the tumbler, nothing's going to open that mind. Fear. Fear actually is a motivator, but it's temporary if it works at all. The reason fear is such a crappy motivator is that we are wired to forget about fearful things. We are wired to downplay the effects of negative outcomes in our mind. So if you were being chased by a bear, for instance, you'd be motivated to run away from that bear. Now, assuming you were a fast runner, you could probably outrun the bear. When it's no longer an intimate when it's no longer an 
imminent threat, you're less motivated to run. I mean, you know there are bears out there, and that knowledge and the fear associated with it is not enough to keep you running all of the time. And now there are some adapted advantage to this. Being a fearful state drains your energy and raises your stress level. Being afraid all the time would burn you out. So the brain compensates by disregarding or downplaying the fear until it no longer motivates. This is why heart patients are so compliant for the first few months of rehab and are so likely to revert to their old ways at their six-month follow-up. Another issue with fear is that it narrows focus. I mean, this is an adaptive advantage because it allows you to focus on the bear and not be distracted by the squirrel. The problem is that this focus kills your ability to think outside the box. This, this focus makes seemingly simple tasks like making the healthiest choice from a menu almost impossible. And finally, we have fixes. When facts and fear fail, we get frustrated and just jump in and try to fix the problem. We push for legislation, prescribe pills, and schedule surgery. Now, I'm not saying these interventions are useless or not valuable, but when applied to behavioral problems, they very often fail. According to a study at the, by the Cooper Institute right here in Texas, as little as three hours of regular exercise a week reduces the symptoms of mild to moderate depression as effectively as Prozac. Yet you won't hear that from the Prozac rep, and they won't teach it in medical school. And even if they do, doctors are not able to write effective exercise prescriptions. And, and what I mean by effective is an exercise a prescription that a patient will actually do. Bariatric surgery is all the rage to fix obesity, but it fails in a surprising number of cases. Many patients actually undergo revision surgeries just to refix the fix that didn't actually fix anything in the first place. They have the facts and they've experienced the fear, but the fix just did not work. Insulin doesn't even cure diabetes, yet many patients treat it as if it did. The threat of diabetes does not evoke the fear response in many patients because they don't see a problem with taking insulin. It's also long been understood that heart surgeries don't cure heart disease. They buy time, they alleviate symptoms, but they don't cure the disease. We know it can, and that's to effectively change behavior, radically change behavior. But heart patients just don't do that. In his book, Community to Change, Harvard professor Dr. Robert Keegan cited a study in which heart patients were told in no uncertain terms they were going to die unless they made changes in their behavior. Now, I know this is a loaded question because I'm clearly up here trying to make a case, but how many of these patients do you think were actually able to make adequate changes? The answer is one in seven. Okay, let me make this real. I want you to count three people to your left and three people to your right. Now, there's a total of seven people with you in the middle. No, oh, I'm sorry. This is the slide that I use when I give the presentation at Harvard. Let me just uh, find the Texas. Nope, nope. This is the one I use when I give the Caltech presentation. Where's the Texas slide? Ah, there is the Texas slide. All right, now we're ready to go. Now, the statistics tell us that only one of you in the seven people you counted out will be able to change your behavior if your life was on the line. So who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Basic psychology says you think it's going to be you. Raise your hand if you think that you'll be able to pull it together and do what it takes to save your own life, to be there for your family, to get back out there and live an active life. Raise your hand. Okay, now look around. That's 100% of the people in the room. That means that 86% of you are wrong. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a study. Uh, I'm going to give everyone a heart attack, and uh, we're going to follow you up for five years. How am I going to do this? Well, I've hired a fleet of New York City cab drivers to drive you all home, and that should be more than enough provocation to give you all heart attacks. All right, listen, seriously, I hope you have a better appreciation for what it means to save a life and how it transcends mere survival.
your role is important because when people are in crisis, especially crises of which they are unaware, they are not equipped to do the mental work necessary to change behavior. They need a skilled guide. They need a leader. And that leader should be you. And this is our change project for ourselves, to become better leaders, to develop the thought patterns and habits of leaders, to behave more like leaders and less like managers. And here's where I make the link between business and patient care and weight loss and the science of behavior change. It all comes down to leadership. When I work with patients to lose weight, what I'm really working on is their personal leadership skills. When we work on patient compliance, what we help patients to do is to lead themselves better. One way in which leaders think radically differently is that they challenge the traditional models of motivation. They don't resort to the old reward and punishment model. One way in which leaders radically and differently think is that they challenge traditional models of motivation. They don't resort to the old reward and punishment model. According to Dan Pink in his book, Drive, the research supports this. There's a whole set of unbelievably interesting studies. I want to give you two that call into question this idea that if you reward something, you get more of the behavior you want. If you punish something, you get less of it. So let's talk, let's go from London to the mean streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the northeastern part of the United States. And let's talk about a study done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here's what they did. They took a whole group of students, and they gave them a set of challenges, things like um, memorizing strings of digits, uh, solving word puzzles, other kinds of spatial puzzles, even physical tasks like throwing a ball through a hoop. Okay, they gave them these challenges and they said to incentivize their performance, they gave them three levels of rewards. Okay? So if you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you got a medium monetary reward. And if you did really well, if you were one of the top performers, you got a large cash prize. Okay? We've seen this movie before. This is essentially a typical motivation scheme within organizations, right? We reward the very top performers. We ignore the low performers and the other folks kind of in the middle. OK, you get a little bit. So what happens? They do the test. They have these incentives. Here's what they found out. One, as long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better their performance. OK, that makes sense. But here's what happens. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. Now, this is strange, right? A larger reward led to poorer performance? How can that possibly be? Now, what's interesting about this is that these folks here who, who, who did this are all economists, at, at, two at MIT, one at the University of Chicago, one at Carnegie Mellon, OK, the top tier of the economics profession. And they're reaching this conclusion that seems contrary to what a lot of us learned in economics, which is, which is that the higher the reward, the better their performance. And they're saying that once you get above rudimentary cognitive skill, it's the other way around, which seems like this kind of, the idea that these rewards don't work that way seems vaguely left-wing and socialist, doesn't it? It's kind of this kind of weird socialist conspiracy. For those of you who have those conspiracy theories, I want to point out the, so, the notoriously left-wing socialist group that financed the research, the Federal Reserve Bank. So this is the mainstream of the mainstream coming to a conclusion that's quite surprising, seems to defy the laws of behavioral physics. So this is strange, a strange finding. So what do they do? They say, Let's, this, is, this is freaky. Let's go test it somewhere else. Maybe that $50 or $60 prize isn't sufficiently motivating for an MIT student, right? So let's go to a place where $50 is actually more significant relatively. Right? So let's take the experiment. We're going to go to Madurai, India, rural India, where $50, $60, whatever the number was, is actually a significant sum of money. So they replicated the experiment in India roughly as follows. Small rewards, the equivalent of two weeks' salary. Um, I mean, sorry, uh, small performance, low performance, two weeks' salary. Medium performance, about a month's salary. Um, High performance, about two months' salary. Okay, so those are real good incentives. Okay, so you're going to get a different result here. Well, what happened though was that the people offered the medium reward did no better than the people offered the small reward, but this time around, the people offered the top reward, they did worst of all. Higher incentives led to worse performance. What's interesting about this is that it actually isn't all that anomalous. This has been replicated over and over and over again by psychologists, 
by um, some extent by sociologists uh, and by economists, over and over and over again. For simple, straightforward tasks, those kinds of incentives, if you do this, then you get that, they're great. For tasks that are algorithmic, set of rules where you have to just follow along and get a right answer, if then rewards, carrots and sticks, outstanding. But when the task gets more complicated, when it requires some conceptual creative thinking, those kinds of motivators demonstrably don't work. Fact, money is a motivator um, at work, but in a slightly strange way. If you don't pay people enough, they won't be motivated. What's curious about, there's another paradox here, which is that the best use of money as a motivator is to pay people enough to take the issue of money off the table. Pay people enough so that they're not thinking about money and they're thinking about the work. Now, once you do that, it turns out there are three factors that the science shows lead to better performance, um, not to mention personal satisfaction. I realized early on that the whole idea of weight loss as a simple eat right, exercise more thing is wrong, wrong, wrong. It's more than that. It's eat right and exercise in the context of human complexity. Emotions come into play, social networks come into play, and the environment comes into play. It's complicated and messy and human. Just like being the leader of a team or taking care of patients, all behavior problems are complicated like this. What's, what we're really talking about here is creativity. You see, leadership works so well for behavior change because creativity thrives with good leadership. Management, on the other hand, was designed to kill creativity. That worked fine on Henry Ford's assembly line when workers were required to do nothing but turn a screw. There was no thinking required. In fact, thinking was a liability. But it doesn't work for complex problems that require creativity. When a problem is complex, when a problem is human, when creativity is required, the motivational landscape shifts. According to Dan Pink, what people need in order to self-motivate and excel at complex tasks are just three things autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So let's talk about autonomy. Listen, everyone knows that people do not like to be told what to do. They do not like to be told what's wrong with them, and nobody likes to be micromanaged. It takes a lot more work, but guiding people to their own conclusions and setting them on a course of self-discovery is far more effective and far more lasting. You know, Google has a program called 20% Time, and this is where they ask their employees to spend 20% of their time to work on anything they want. And they get paid for it. They work on whatever they want. What's the result? Gmail, AdSense, and Google News, just to, add a, just to name a few. And this idea is actually not new. In the 1950s, 3M did a similar thing, and they called it the 15% Project. And what happened? Post-it notes and masking tape. Mastery. Let's face it, people like getting good at stuff. They like to solve problems, but here's the catch. They only like to solve problems that are in their grasp, just within their grasp. If the task is too easy, it gets boring. If it's too hard, they just give up. They need it just right, and they'll actually enjoy doing it. In psychology, this is called flow, and it's used to describe a mental state in which a person is performing an activity and they are fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment in the process of the activity. It is often considered the pinnacle of human experience. When you're in flow, the concept of time disappears and you find a sense of bliss. According to psychologist Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, flow is a completely focused motivation. It is a single-minded immersion that represents perhaps the ultimate experience in harnessing the emotions in the service of performing and learning. In flow, the emotions are not just contained and channeled, but positive and energized and aligned with the task at hand. It seems that true pleasure and fulfillment in humans is somehow linked to mastering things. When people are allowed to believe they can master something and they're given the tools and support to master it, motivation simply happens. Purpose. Actually, that's a porpoise, but never mind. Suffice to say that purpose drives behavior. People will do almost anything if they believe it's for a damn good reason. When Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how, 
he was talking about the incredible capacity for human beings to endure in the service of their purpose. Viktor Frankl observed this in Auschwitz. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he noted what seemed to separate those who survived from those who perished was that the survivors seemed to have a purpose to live, or at least they believed they had a purpose to live. Think of leadership as creativity cultivation. Think of leaders as being able to see the best in people and draw it out. Leaders encourage innovation, they nurture skills, they develop talents, they clarify purpose, and they inspire people to act because they truly want to act. With effective leadership, people don't need to be motivated because they're motivated from within. So in summary, behavior change is the solution. Without decisive action, everything else becomes a waste of time. Behavioral problems require creative solutions, and your, and your leadership style can cultivate it or kill it. Stop trying to manage problems and start leading people to lasting solutions. Or we could just let the government solve the problem. Congress today passed a landmark Social Security reform bill they estimate could save the troubled program billions by encouraging Americans to live faster and die younger. The so-called grab life by the balls bill includes provisions to cut the cost of cigarettes in half, outlaws helmets, and adjusts the CDC's recommended amount of sleep from eight hours a night to when you're dead. The most effective way to stem our out of control Social Security budget is for all Americans to go out early in a blaze of glory. The bill's long-term initiatives, like repealing all gun laws and replacing train crossing warnings with signs encouraging motorists to speed up, are expected to save Americans millions annually by gradually reducing their average lifespan by 15 to 20 years. The bill's short-term initiatives aim to immediately cut current Social Security costs in half by replacing senior citizens' monthly checks with vouchers for grain alcohol, back alley tattoos, and extreme sports. I, I got this coupon to motocross over a canyon. I guess I better do my part to help the deficit. But some critics are not convinced the bill will be enough to save the program from bankruptcy. We need a much more aggressive policy here, like my proposal to require all commercial airlines to do a barrel roll hmm. while coming in for a landing. Are you kidding me? We need to privatize. The government has no right telling me who to raw dog and what to explode. Supporters in Congress say the cost will be offset by the so-called pussy tax on products such as sweaters, vegetables, hand soap, and flu shots. America, would you rather die old Broke and forgotten, or die a <laughs> legend. The new program follows in the footsteps of the Life is a Cartoon Medicare campaign, which encourages seniors to run full speed off of cliffs and smoke sticks of dynamite. Moving on, KFC has unveiled a new line of boneless employees. 